ओम ज्ञान तिमीरांधस्या ज्ञानंजना शलाकया चक्षुरन्मिलिता तस्मा श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतन्यमनोभीष्टम स्थापित ये न भूतले स्वयं कदाम ददा स्वापदाक वंदेह श्रीगुर श्रीयुतापदकमल श्रीगुरोन वैष्णवांश श्रीरूपा सागर जा सह गना रघुनाथ तम सजीव साधता सवधूत बरिचना सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य देव श्रीराधा कृष्ण पाद सह गना ललिता श्री विशाखान्विता हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीनबंधु जगत्पते गोपेशा गोपिका कांता राधा कांता नमोस्तुते तप्त कंचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानो सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वंशा कल्पतरुभ्य कृपा सिंधुव्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवभ्यो नमो नम श्रीकृष्णा चैतन्य प्रभु निनांद श्रीअद्वैतगदाधर श्रीवासदिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे शुल भगुपाद की जय अनंत कोति वैष्णव वृंद की जय Today we are talking about gratitude. Gratitude has become such a big thing in the world today. You know, people keep gratitude journals and people talk so much about how it's important every day to be grateful for everything that we've received in our life. In our Vaishnava tradition, we also know that gratitude is such a big thing. If you think about our life as Vaishnavas, <clears throat> when we walk, wake up in the morning we do mangal aarti that's gratitude isn't it i uh, before we uh have any kind of class or any kind of discussion on shastra we offer mangal acharan that's gratitude before we take prasadam uh sharirar vidya jal it's gratitude krishna bhola doya moy krishna is so kind that he's giving us this prasadam if you are second initiated then three times in the day you stop why for gratitude and uh, we were always taught in the ashram that before you go to bed at night you should pay your obeisances and you should offer gratitude so can you see that although the world today talks about gratitude and having a gratitude journal and remembering as vaishnavas this is part of our life we do this every day we count our blessings sanatan goswami he looks at chaitanya mahaprabhu and he says i am only made of your mercy and practically if we look at our life then we see that we're made of mercy uh we have received so much in our life the tendency of the human mind is to undervalue what we have and overvalue what we don't have this is our basic problem in life right whatever we have we undervalue and whatever we don't have we think like it's so valuable why don't i have it and therefore most people in this world are perpetually living in dissatisfaction because they haven't um developed the quality of gratitude they say gratitude is a great attitude and uh, if you're not grateful then you are a great fool and therefore um is so much uh, understood in the world they say in the world the grass is always greener on the other side <laughs> 
when we were at school, they told us the story of the crow. You know, the crow was once looking at its life and the crow was thinking, just look at me, just look at my life. I'm, I just have one color. I'm not very, uh, not very beautiful at all. Just look at the parrot. The parrot is such a beautiful, uh, you know, so striking in its colors. Everyone is uh, attracted to the parrot. So then the crow went to the parrot and the crow said, you're so fortunate, you're so beautiful, you're so uh, attractive. And the parrot looked at the crow and said, yeah, I used to also think the same. But, you know, then I looked at the peacock and I saw the peacock had uh, hundreds of colors and the peacock, the way it spreads its, you know, feathers uh, just attracts the world. And so the crow and the parrot went to the peacock and the peacock in the zoo was there and thousands of people were coming to see the peacock and the crow and the parrot said, you know, you are, you are the most fortunate. Just see, you're so attractive, you're so striking and just see the proof is that thousands of people come to see you every day. You're so fortunate. Um, and then the peacock said, yes, I also used to think, but for my beauty, I have been imprisoned within a cage. And I look around at this whole zoo and there are many birds which have been imprisoned in this zoo, but there's only one bird which I don't see in this zoo. And that bird is the crow. So nowadays I kind of look at myself and think, I'd be so fortunate if I was a crow. And in that moment, the crow realized that maybe, just maybe, it's not as bad as I think it is. So in Sanskrit, gratitude is known as krita gya. You know this word, gya means to know, like gyan we say, and krita means what has been done. So the Sanskrit word is a beautiful language, isn't it? The Sanskrit word for gratitude is literally to know what has been done. When we don't know what has been done, when we are not conscious of what has been done, then we will, uh, we will always be ungrateful. Akrita, yeah. So therefore, for Vaishnavas, they're always remembering everything that's been done for them. In, in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, it's very beautiful. Narad Muni is instructing uh, Vasudev, and he quotes a very famous verse that Srila Prabhupada often quoted. Devarshi bhutaptan rinam pitrinam nakinkaro nayam rini charajan sarvatmanaya saranam saranyam gato mukundam kartam. Naraji, he says that um, when we're born in this world, we're indebted. We, we must feel grateful, number one, to the devas, number two, to the rishis, the sages, number three, to apta, our relatives, and uh, number four, to the pitris, our forefathers. We must always feel gratitude for them. Number one, to the devas, we have to feel grateful because the demigods are providing all the necessities of life. Though therefore, it's said that to show your gratitude to the devas, you have to do yagya. And then it said rishis. The rishis are giving us knowledge. And therefore, uh, we should always be grateful to the rishis. And the way you show your gratitude to the rishis is that you uh, study the Vedas and become a student, Brahmacharya. Um, and then it said, uh, Apta, our family, our relatives, we should always feel grateful to them uh, because without their selfless sacrifice, where would we be? Uh, therefore, it said that one must shoulder family responsibilities in order to repay their debt, to show their gratitude to their family. And then it said, uh, Pitri, the forefathers, uh, how do we uh, show our gratitude to the forefathers by doing shrad, by doing like different yagyas for the deceased relatives, and also by having children, um, because that carries on the tradition. 
But then Naraji says in the verse, Nakin karo nayam vinicha rajan. But if you, Sarvatmana sharanam, if you take full shelter, Mukunda of Lord Krishna, then you're no longer indebted. Just by serving Krishna, you show your gratitude to all of these uh, individual uh, entities. Because yathataror mula nisechanena, if you water the root, the mula, the root of the tree, then the whole tree becomes satisfied. So gratitude is definitely there within our tradition and is such an important aspect. But today, I want to take a little different uh, angle on gratitude. In the world today, people uh, feel as though they are developing gratitude. What I want to share with you today is that the magnitude of the gratitude that the Vaishnavas have because of their spiritual realization is on a completely different level to the gratitude that people have in the world. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you. And I think this will be interesting for you um, because what I think this will help you to do is also understand uh, how Krishna conscious am I? Because this level of gratitude that I'm going to show you today that is embodied by the Vaishnavas can only be generated in the consciousness of someone who's actually very, very close to Krishna. And so today, uh, we're not just talking about gratitude, but hopefully we're going to share something with you that will help you to deeply reflect on um, where we are in our own uh, Krishna consciousness. I'm going to show you this table and, and see if it makes you think. Normally, we are grateful in prosperity, isn't it? When things are going well, when our children get the jobs we want them to get and they get the grades they want, when our daughter gets married to the ideal person, uh, when our health is good, when we achieve some fortune and security in our life, generally that's the time when it's easier to be grateful, right? But can we also be grateful in adversity? That is only possible for someone who's Krishna conscious. Someone who's not Krishna conscious may be able to be grateful in prosperity, but not in adversity. This is the special feature of a devotee. I'm going to expand on these, but I'm just, I want to show you a little bit. We are grateful for ourselves, isn't it? When something happens in my life, when something happens in my journey, when something happens to my family, when something happens at my temple, uh, then we generally feel that gratitude. But the Vaishnav is equally grateful when things are happening in other people's lives. Now, can you do that? Even if you can do the left side, can you do the right side? That's only possible for a Krishna conscious person, okay? We are grateful when we receive, isn't it? I'm getting this. I'm achieving this. This is appearing in my life. And therefore, when we receive, it's easy to be grateful because we see something in front of us in our life. But are we grateful when we have the opportunity to give? to serve, to contribute to others. Gratitude is not just about what you receive, but being equally grateful in the opportunity to give. That kind of gratitude is spiritual gratitude. We are grateful when we understand the plan of Krishna, when we understand, oh, this is the lesson, or when we look back and we understand, oh, Krishna was doing that, and now I can understand 
why uh, that happened and therefore I feel grateful for it now. But can you be grateful when you don't understand? When you're completely baffled? When you're completely bewildered? When you're completely bemused by what uh, divinity seems to be arranging in your life? That kind of gratitude when you don't understand is a deeper type of gratitude. And we are grateful in the mind. Many people can be grateful in the mind. Yes, yeah, so many things have been happening. I remember it. I, it's in my mind. I appreciate it in my consciousness. But the Vaishnava shows that they're grateful, not just in their mind, but it's reflected in their activities. It's reflected in what they do for others. And today, what I want to share with you is that take a snapshot of this table in your mind and ask yourself, how much am I on the left side? Even on the left side, we struggle sometimes. But how much even beyond the left side can I be grateful on the right side? Because when you have this, what I call 360 degree gratitude all around, then what will happen is in your life, in all directions. Prabodhananda Saraswati says, Vishwam Purna Sukhaya Day. Everywhere I look, I see only happiness. It's funny because Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, Mamupetya Punar Janma Dukhalayam Ashashvatam. Krishna rubber stamps the world as a place of misery. And Prabodhananda Saraswati comes in and he says, Vishwampurna Sukhaya Day. Everywhere I look, I just see happiness. <laughs> and you think, are they reading from the same book? Is this the same philosophy? Is this the same parampara? But yes, Krishna says, when you try to exploit, when you try to enjoy, when you try to control, when you try to be the center selfishly of the material world, then know for sure that the material world will be a place of misery. But when you're grateful, when you're in the mood of giving, when you're in the spirit of a servant, then the whole world will be full of happiness for you because uh, everywhere you will only see sources of Krishna's mercy. Um, and so let us just reflect one by one on each one of these and see what is it that is uh, being told to us? I'm just going to stop this for now so I can see all of you. First thing is, we can be happy in prosperity, but can we be happy in adversity? You see, Prahlad Maharaj was as grateful when Nishingadev came as he was, and he, was, he had the same amount of gratitude when he was being tortured by the servants of Hiranyakashipu. There was no difference. It was not that, oh, now Nishingadev has appeared. Now I feel very grateful. Even when Prahlad was being tortured, he was feeling incredible gratitude. They asked Prahlad, when they threw you into the fire, were you not scared? And what did Prahlad say? Yagyavai Vishnu. The fire is the mouth of Vishnu. Vishnu is my father. You think if you put me in the mouth of my father, he will eat me? That was his consciousness. They said, Prahlad, were you not scared when they fed you poison? Prahlad said, look, the demigods and demons were churning the milk ocean. And first Lakshmi Devi came out. And then later on, poison came out. That means poison and Lakshmi Devi are brother and sister. And Lakshmi Devi is the consort of my father, Vishnu. So do you think my maternal uncle will cause any harm to me? No. They said, Prahlad, were you not scared when, uh, when uh, Hiranya Kashipu is an evil henchman? Were you not scared when they uh, put you in a pit of snakes? 
So Prahlad said, my father is Vishnu and Vishnu, he rests on Anantashesh and Anantashesh is the king of all the snakes. So these snakes are servants of the servant of my father. So do you think the servant of my servant will cause any pain to me? Isn't it amazing consciousness? Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Yo maam pasyati sarvatra sarvam cha mai pasyati dasyaham na pranashyami sachame na pranashyati For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost nor are they ever lost to me. In other words, one has gratitude in prosperity and also in adversity because what's happening is that they're seeing Krishna in both situations. Pariksha was just as grateful when he was uh, cursed by the Brahmin boy to die in seven days as he was when he was saved by Krishna in the womb against the Brahmastra of Ashvatam. The devotee has equal amount of gratitude in prosperity and adversity because they know that behind everything is Krishna's hand. Every arrangement of Krishna is perfect. And therefore they learn this art. Even Srila Prabhupada said, Krishna tested me in two ways. First, Krishna gave me, uh, first Krishna took everything away from me. And then Krishna gave me everything. And Srila Prabhupada said, when Krishna took everything away from me, I was grateful. And when Krishna gave me everything, I was grateful. And later on, if Krishna wants to take everything away, I'm grateful. Because the devotee realizes that, yes, Krishna is uh, moving everything. Um, so sometimes when something good happens, then we think it's us. And when something bad happens, we look up at God and we say, like, what are you doing? Like, uh, bad, bad arrangements. There was a famous tennis player. His name was Arthur Ashe. Um, he was a famous, like, I don't know if you know in New Zealand, but anyway, Wimbledon, you know Wimbledon, yeah, that's an international thing. Anyway, what happened is that he won the Wimbledon, you know, championship. And then what happened is that some years later, he uh, got this blood disease, which was very, very, uh, like one in like hundreds of thousands of people may get it. So they came to him on a television interview and they said, uh, don't you sometimes wonder why did God do this to you? Why did God give you such a, uh, you know, a rare disease out of everyone in the world? Why did it have to be you? And his answer was historic. You know what he said? He said over 50 million people, over 50 million children in the world start playing tennis. He said five of them, may, five million of them may get to the professional level. And out of those, 5,000 may get on the worldwide circuit. And out of them, 50 may reach Wimbledon. And out of them, four get to the semi-final and two get to the final. And out of those two, one may win Wimbledon. And when I won Wimbledon, I didn't look up at God and say, why me? I accepted it at that time. That's God's grace. Automatically, I accepted it. And now in this situation, in the very same way, just as effortlessly, just as gratefully, just as gracefully, I accept that that is the uh, will of God. And this is like such a beautiful way of living life that, um, you know, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, he, he has these ways of putting things into words, isn't it? He says, uh, not everything that happens is good, but something good can come from everything that happens, isn't it? He's like, I don't know how he comes out with all of these things. Another time he said, uh, uh, everyone has to live with pain. 
but you don't have to live in pain <laughs> which is a nice thought also that pain all these adversities they'll all come but the devotee learns the art of how to accept it that in this uncomfortable situation you know uh, you know, uncomfortable situations, is there, it's not that they're desirable. We don't want uncomfortable situations. But at the same time, we have to realize that it's not that they're unnatural. They come for a reason. They're part of Krishna's plan. So the first type of uh, 360 degree gratitude is that we realize that we should not just be grateful in prosperity, but we should be similarly grateful in adversity. Because that is another way of Krishna showing um, his kindness. The other type of gratitude that I want to share with you today is that we should not just be grateful for ourselves, but we should be equally grateful for other people. You know that feeling of gratitude that you have in your heart when something uh, goes according to a beautiful plan that you desired and it just manifests by divine grace, how that makes you feel in your heart. Now we have to ask, have I ever felt that feeling when something beautiful has happened in someone else's life? His Holiness Radnath Maharaj says, it's difficult uh, to feel genuine, um, genuine sorrow in someone else's pain. Like It's difficult to feel genuine sorrow in someone else's pain. But he says, it's even more difficult to feel genuine happiness in someone else's success. If you get to that point, then you can understand you have developed a very, very high level of spiritual realization. You know, like uh, if you read Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's very, very beautiful because Mahaprabhu, what he is doing is he's not just spreading Krishna consciousness everywhere, but then what he's doing is he's collecting all of these souls and he's uh, building a community of love. So if you see Jagannath Puri, then it becomes a community of love because there's all these incredible Vaishnavas, Haridas Thakur, Raghunath Das Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, uh, Ramananda Rai. They're all there together in Jagannath Puri and they're having such beautiful loving exchanges amongst each other. And one of the most amazing things that you see is that when one of them receives the mercy of Mahaprabhu, when one of them receives the grace of the Lord, when Rupa Goswami writes his verses and Mahaprabhu looks at it and is completely dumbfounded, like how did he write these things? Then everyone is looking at Rupa Goswami and feeling so grateful. Because it's not like, oh, Rupa Goswami is getting all the mercy. Rupa Goswami is getting all the attention and it's away from me. They're feeling just as grateful because what's happening is that they're seeing that this is the glory of the Lord. They're seeing that this is the Lord's glory. This is the amazing uh, character of the Supreme Person that he is investing his mercy uh, so beautifully in, in others. And that increases their appreciation of Krishna. So uh, our gratitude, when it's genuine spiritual gratitude, it's never selfish. It's never just for ourselves, But it's feeling grateful when others are also receiving the grace. Uh, normally, uh, that is very, very difficult for people in the material world, you know. Because we're constantly competing, we're constantly comparing, we're constantly uh, judging ourselves based on what others are happening, what's happening in their life. Isn't it like there's this, uh, the famous story of two neighbors, isn't it? In England, they say keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, in India, it might be keeping up with the Patels or whatever it may be. 
but we're always comparing ourselves to the neighbor isn't it so then once a genie came and he said to the man you can have anything you want but the only deal is that your neighbor will get double so he in the moment he didn't think about it he just heard you get anything you want so he thought yeah yeah anyway whatever it is i want you know i want that boon and then what happened is he just said i want a bmw you know and then and then whoosh, just came about but then he saw the neighbor had like two and and you know that made him more miserable than anything then he thought no no i want a five story house and boom it went up and then he looked out of the window out of the fifth story and he looked up and it was like the neighbor's got 10 stories he goes oh no this whole situation is making me more miserable and then you know what he said right he said okay I want to go blind in one eye. That is envy. Can you imagine how deep envy goes? Just think about this for a second. We may, uh, we may not also be that far away of sometimes having thoughts like that. Because to be grateful means not just to be grateful for what I've received in my life, to, but to be grateful in a way in which I appreciate what everyone's getting and how that illuminates Krishna's wonderful, wonderful character. 360 degree gratitude means I'm not just grateful when I'm receiving things. Most religion is just about receiving, getting, um, owning, uh, they say, if you like God, then you'll go up to God. Well, a student asked his teacher, what's the difference between liking and loving? And the teacher said, see that flower? If you like it, then you'll go up to it, you'll pick it, you'll smell it, you'll enjoy it, and then you'll discard it. And he said, if you love that flower, then what you'll do is you'll go up to it, you'll protect it, you water it, you nourish it, you let it grow so that it displays its full colors and its full fragrance, and then you'll uh, share that with others. That's the difference between liking and loving. And then he said, most people, they like God because they go up to God and they're asking, they're demanding, they're expecting, they're, 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 they're in the mood of receiving. But when you love God, you'll go up to God and you'll be in the spirit of serving, the spirit of giving, the spirit of appreciating, the spirit of wanting to uh, be selfless. And so gratitude is not just about receiving things, but gratitude on a spiritual level is feeling as grateful when I have the opportunity to give. We may feel gratitude when something comes into our life, but when we have the opportunity to give, say, for example, give your time or give your energy or give your money or give your uh, um, intelligence, do we feel as grateful in that situation as when we're receiving something? If you do, that's a brilliant sign. Because that means you really have 360 degree gratitude. Because what can be more valuable to receive in this world than the opportunity to serve? Just think about that. What can be more valuable in your life to receive than the opportunity to serve? Once we had one devotee at our temple, um, his name was Jiva Pati Prabhu. He was... Uh, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, he joined in the 70s. And um, for four decades, he served Sri Sri Radha Gokulananda like every day. Mangalartis, he was just like on the altar every single day. At one point, he became very sick and he went to the, uh, the, the local hospital near the manor. So the devotees would regularly visit him in hospital. And then one day, one devotee came in 
And Jiva Patipa was looking very, very sad. So the devotee said to him, what's the, what's the problem? So he said, the doctor came to me today. And the doctor said to me that um, there's a chance that I can come out of hospital. Um, so the devotee said, that's great. And he said, but then the devotee, to, uh, the doctor told me that even if I come out of hospital, I'll never be able to do my service like how I was doing it. And then he said to the devotee, uh, if I can't serve, what's the purpose of my life? So the devotee felt quite, you know, he felt a little bad about that. Anyway, then he left that evening. And the next morning, they got the phone call that Jiva Pati Prabhu had left his body. And the devotee's reflection was that all these months he was fighting in the hospital because he had a sense that maybe one day I can come out and do my service again. But once he heard that even if you come out, you can't do your service, then there, it's like, what, then what's the reason to live? Then there's no reason to live. There's no reason to exist. We exist to serve. We exist to give. And then he, then the devotee thought, because he lost the will to live, then he just, you know, then Krishna just took him. He left the body. And so that's very, very powerful, isn't it? It's just like this being grateful, isn't it? Every single day we sing, we're praying to Tulsi Maharani that uh, please give me the qualification of devotional service. That is a privilege, the privilege of devotional service. Um, how grateful are we to have the privilege to serve? Um, it's uh, we should realize that uh, you know, Srila Prabhupada, he um, he went to Surat. I heard on the beginning of this call many people speaking in Gujarati, so I could understand it's the there's quite a few Gujaratis here. And Srila Prabhupada, he went to Surat, isn't it? And in Surat, he got such an amazing uh, welcome uh, by, the, by the locals there. All the Western devotees and the international devotees were garlanded, taken care of. Anyway, 25 devotees had gone there and they stayed in the house of one Mr. Jariwala. He was in Surat. So he was so privileged to host the Vaishnavas. Like he just felt like the Vaishnavas have come to my home today and he was just feeling such overwhelming appreciation that he had the opportunity to serve the devotees. So he were, him and his wife and family, they were cooking for the 25 devotees. You know, I mean, 25 Hare Krishnas in your house is, is ecstatic, but it's not always easy, you know? gumshas everywhere you know all kinds of uh, waking up at all hours of the night loud chanting you know it's not easy anyway he cooked for them he provided their lodging he did everything you know many of them were sick because they were in india he nursed them back to health and everything um sometimes you know they were like also voracious eaters it was like feeding the army you know it was not easy Anyway, what happened is he hosted them for some time. After like some two weeks or something of hosting them, they were, they, they were all going to leave now. So what he did is he brought them all in the front room. Srila Prabhupada also came. And so they were all sitting in the front room, all the devotees who he had served. And Srila Prabhupada was also there. And then he started in front of everyone, he started expressing his appreciation. He said, you have come to my home. You've graced my home. You've given me an opportunity to serve you. How many lifetimes did I wait for this? Thank you so much. And then what he did is he gave an envelope to every single devotee. He paid obeisances to them. And then after paying obeisances to all of them and giving the envelope, 
with tears in his eyes, he was crying and he said, you please, please forgive me if there has been anything wrong that I've done in my service while you've been here. I mean, the devotees just couldn't understand, like they had never seen this kind of gratitude. And Srila Prabhupada, who was quiet the whole way through, he looked at all the devotees and he said, this is Vaishnav. If you want to understand who is a Vaishnav, you learn from this person. Because Vaishnav means they understand that the opportunity to serve is the thing that we should be most grateful for in our life. Uh, we don't earn a life by what we get. We earn a living by what we get. But we earn a life by what we give. And therefore, gratitude is not just for what we receive in our life, but gratitude for the opportunity to serve is a deeper type of uh, gratitude. 360 degree gratitude also means to not just be grateful when we understand Krishna's plan, but to be grateful even when life is confusing, even when life is completely, uh, uh, it just doesn't make any sense to us. Bhishma Dev was on the uh, battlefield, on the bed of arrows, and then at the end of the Kurukshetra war, Yudhisthira and others came to him. And what did Bhishma Dev say? Nahyasya karhichit papan puman veda vidit satam yad vijigyasaya yukta muyanti kavyo pihi. Bhishma Dev said, Nahyasya. No one can understand the plan of Krishna. You Pandavas had all dharma, all piety. You had all knowledge. You were supported by all great personalities. You even had Krishna as your constant companion. And still you had to suffer. We just become completely confused. But still, Bhishma Dev said, we fully surrender to Krishna. We still love Krishna. Because, you see, for a devotee, they know that whatever, because they have love for Krishna, they never doubt Krishna. You see, like sometimes, if there is a loved one in your life, like some of you are married, so you've known each other for so many years, and you have so much love between you. So, Someday, if you wake up and your husband or your wife does something very, very like strange, your immediate reaction won't be to just cut the relation. Your immediate reaction will be, there must be some explanation behind it because I know them on a deeper level. I know who they are. I know what they're about and I know their character. And therefore, sometimes if they even do something a little bit strange, it doesn't throw you off the relationship because you realize, no, no, I know this person. There must be something behind it. So similarly, when one has a deep relationship of love with Krishna, even when Krishna does things which are very, very difficult to understand, still a devotee will feel great gratitude because they'll know, look, Krishna is my best friend and Krishna controls everything. That's an unbeatable combination. If Krishna is your best friend and Krishna controls everything, even if I don't understand what's happening around me, then still I'll feel incredible gratitude because I will understand something is happening here which is going to bring me to a higher level of love, a higher intensity of connection with Krishna, and therefore they embrace it even when they don't understand it. Can you embrace it even when you don't understand it? This is only possible if one has a deeper level of gratitude which comes from genuine Krishna consciousness. And so 360 degree gratitude means be grateful when you understand, but also be grateful, just as grateful when you don't understand, because you know that behind it is the loving hand of Krishna. Krishna will never let me down. 
<clears throat> and the final thing I want to share with you today is that real gratitude is not just gratitude, which is something in the mind, but the deepest type of gratitude reflects in your activities. It reflects in your life. You see, gratitude can be on deep, different levels. One thing is recognizing what has been done for you. But higher than that is remembering, constantly being aware of what has been done for you. But higher than that is reciprocating, showing that I am actually deeply grateful and demonstrating that by actually reciprocating and doing something in your life to actually um, show your appreciation for those things. And therefore, uh, some people, they don't even recognize what has been done for them. But some people recognize what has been done for them, but it's not constantly something that they're remembering. And some people, they recognize and they're constantly remembering, but they don't do anything in their life to reciprocate with that. So we must also act. We must also do something. Srila Prabhupada would go out on morning walks. And uh, one time in America, every morning he was going out for morning walks and there was one devotee. And so one devotee, what he would do is when Srila Prabhupada was coming out, he would glorify Srila Prabhupada with a verse from the Bhagavatam. So one day Srila Prabhupada was walking out on his morning walk and then he recited this verse from the Bhagavatam as Srila Prabhupada was walking out. Tvam nasandarshito dhatra dustaram nistitirshatam Kalim Sattva Haram Pumshak Karnadhar Ivarnavam. This is uh, the sages are glorifying Sutta Goswami. So he echoes this prayer to Srila Prabhupada. We think we have met your goodness by the will of providence just so that we may accept you as the captain of the ship which will carry us across the material world. Uh, into the spiritual world, the land of Krishna. So he was glorifying Srila Prabhupada like this. Srila Prabhupada just stopped right in front of him. He looked at him and he looked at the other devotees and he said, doesn't he have any service to do? Why is he just glorifying me every day? He should do some service. He should do something practical. If he feels so much appreciation, then he should demonstrate it by actually doing something in his life. You know, so Srila Prabhupada was a very, very practical person. That's not to say we shouldn't glorify the spiritual master with our words. Yes, of course we must. That is a great opportunity. We must do that. But the real glorification is what do you do with your life? Srila Prabhupada, when he was at the Vyasa Puja of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he said, uh, this is a festival honoring our spiritual master. But it's not just a festival of fruits and flowers. It's not just a festival of flowery words, but the one who serves the order of the spiritual master is the one who really glorifies the spiritual master, the one who acts in accordance with the desire of the spiritual master is the one who demonstrates the deepest level of gratitude because real gratitude is not just the emotion in the mind, but it's reflected in the tangible service that one does to show their uh, great appreciation. And so one time a devotee actually asked Srila Prabhupada, he said, Srila Prabhupada, uh, what can we do to repay you? Um, and then Srila Prabhupada said, just chant Hare Krishna. And then Srila Prabhupada paused for some moments and then he said, actually, you should always feel obliged. A very powerful line, actually. Srila Prabhupada said, you should always feel obliged. You should always feel, no, I have to do more. 
I asked one Srila Prabhupada disciple, his name is Kishore Prabhu, at the manor. I asked him once, what do you feel like on Srila Prabhupada's uh, disappearance day when you come in front of Srila Prabhupada? And he said to me, I feel the same thing everything, every single day when I come in front of Srila Prabhupada. I said, what's that? He said, every single day when I come in front of Srila Prabhupada, I feel challenged. I feel challenged. What am I doing? What am I doing to show my appreciation, my gratitude to Srila Prabhupada? Uh, I feel, no, I should be doing more. It's not enough. So we feel that we must do something. Sometimes I go to Vrindavan, you know, like every year, for many years, what I used to do is I used to go to Vrindavan in January after the marathon, the Srila Prabhupada book marathon. You know, it's a very intense month in December. And then you go to Vrindavan and you're just like, okay, I'm here in Vrindavan. Now I can just read and chant. And so I remember every year I used to go to Vrindavan and you know, when we go to Vrindavan, then in the morning, first we go to Srila Prabhupada's Samadhi for the Mangalarti there. And you know what used to happen to me every single year when I used to go to Vrindavan is I was so fortunate to be in Vrindavan. I was feeling like now I can just immerse myself in hearing and chanting. And then what would happen is after about four or five days, I would go to Srila Prabhupada's uh, Samadhi, Mangalarti Samadhi. And when I would look at Srila Prabhupada, I would hear voices. And the voice was Srila Prabhupada's voice. And Srila Prabhupada's voice was like, yeah, it's nice you're here. When are you going back? When are you going back to do your service? When are you going back to preach? And I was like, no, Srila Prabhupada, I'm here. Like, I just want to be here. I want to hear and chant. And... And Prabhupada was telling me, no, no, there's a big mission, there's a big uh, task, there's a big responsibility. Um, every year on Srila Prabhupada's disappearance day, Gopal Krishna Maharaj, what he does in Srila Prabhupada's house at the time when Srila Prabhupada departs, you know, it's very, I don't know if any of you have ever been, it's very powerful if you're in Srila Prabhupada's house at the time when he departed, like every year they do that. What Gopal Krishna Maharaj does is he gets Srila Prabhupada's chadar. This is the chadar that Srila Prabhupada was wearing uh, when he departed the world. And what Gopal Krishna Maharaj does is he puts it, uh, he blesses everyone who, if you're fortunate enough to get in the house, then you can. So somehow or other, this year I got in, you know, what to say is one of the perks of being a sannyasi, you know, you can uh, walk into these kind of situations, you know. So somehow or other, I was there at that moment and Gopal Krishna Maharaj came and he put Srila Prabhupada's chadar. And when he put Srila Prabhupada, Kadama Khan Maharaj used to say this, when he puts the chadar on your head, then you feel the heavy responsibility, the heavy expectation, the heavy desire of Srila Prabhupada to spread this Krishna consciousness movement. And so in that moment, I was feeling, no, no, if I'm really grateful for what Srila Prabhupada has done, then I have to do something to serve him. I have to show it in my acts. And so today what I'm trying to share with you is, uh, is this. I'm trying to share with you that gratitude in the world is becoming promoted more and more. But in spiritual circles, gratitude goes very, very deep. And gratitude means not just in prosperity, but in adversity not just for ourselves, but for others, not just when getting something, but having the opportunity to serve, to give, and not just when we know uh, what Krishna's plan is in this situation, but even when we don't know. And gratitude is not just a feeling, it's an act.
It's something that's reflected in our life. And I think uh, if we develop this type of gratitude, if we develop this type of uh, appreciation, then it will be transformational. Vishvam Purna Sukhayate, then everywhere you look, you'll feel happiness. And so these are some words I wanted to share with you on gratitude. We could have looked at this from so many different angles. But today I felt inspired to share this angle with you. The magnitude of gratitude. Uh, I hope it's been uh, somewhat useful for you. Uh, Ambrish Maharaj Prabhu, I don't know if we have time uh, for having some discussion or questions. I'm happy to do that. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, if you have time, then uh, it will be good to have some questions and answers as well. And thank you very yeah, much, it's Maharaj. Good the morning here. So, <laughs> yeah. thank you very so much for your yeah. very inspiring class. And um, I think it was a completely different angle that you have covered um, the gratitude classes. So many classes that we hear, but I think this was completely a different angle. That how deep the Vaishnavas have to go in gratitude. Uh, Maharaj, I will like to start with one question and um, I'm sure that there are many devotees here online and they may also have a question. So please raise your hands uh, in the meantime where, while I'm starting with this question. Maharaj, this uh, question is about uh, gratitude itself uh, is a great quality to have. And you're mentioning about this left hand side and right hand side. Even when the uh, devotees are even sometimes struggling to show gratitude, which is shown on the left hand side. So how do we actually go to this extra mile and go to that right hand side? Yes, it is. There are wonderful examples of Vaishnavas, but how do we travel from this left hand to the right hand uh, side of your table? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, the first reason I gave you the table is that what we have to try to do in our life is at least when the on the right hand side, at least intellectually start to train our mind. Uh, that no, no, I should be grateful in this situation. So when adversity comes, it's not like that all of us are just going to be naturally grateful. But what we remember is that no, the great Vaishnavas were feeling grateful even in adversity. Now can I think, can I explore, can I look in my heart deeply and try to see what uh, what is why Krishna may be doing this and what I can learn from this and how this can actually be helpful in my spiritual life. So what happens is we develop this mentality of looking, looking for gratitude. We may not feel the gratitude automatically, but we begin looking for it. Tomorrow, someone may give you a service and, you know, like, what can you say in the Hare Krishna movement? There's no shortage of service. And you think that, oh, no, another service, you know, another. But then in that moment, we try to think like, what? Like, this is a great opportunity to serve. You know, how can I do this in the best way I can? What gifts will come to me for my spiritual life from this? So in Krishna consciousness, what we're often doing is trying to develop something first on the intellectual level. And then what we're doing is it's going deeper and deeper, and then it's naturally coming to the heart level. So uh, by understanding how we can be grateful in all situations, even when we don't feel that gratitude, at least we can begin to intellectually see, no, th there is much to be grateful for in, in this situation, you know. Yes, thank you very much, Mahesh. Thank you. Uh, there are a few hands raised. Uh, Gaurachandra Prabhu, please go ahead with your question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Very nice to see you, Maharaj. And I really want to thank you, uh, not just for this class, but for all the classes that you have been giving. Really, really, really nice and really deep. And so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, uh, Maharaj. And uh, just, Maharaj, my question is, uh, uh, I guess, more on, on tolerance. Uh, you know, so like, obviously, we have a plan on paper, uh, you know, okay, if this happens, you know, this is Krishna's plan. And if this happens, then I'll do this, I'll do that. But when the situation comes, some, un, you know, unpleasant situation comes, then, then, 
I guess uh, you know we we fail incredibly, and uh, <clears throat> after a few days we we realized that uh, uh, okay you know yeah so that was the the plan and this is how you know one should have acted, and uh, and also I guess you know like sometimes maybe you know some unpleasant behavior from others can really you know disturb us when we are not prepared. Maybe it's due to not us being very strong and have no faith maybe, or I don't know, uh, you know, it's lack of what really. So I guess how can we become more tolerant uh, with the behavior, not usually from devotees, but maybe something coming from, uh, <clears throat> I guess, uh, uh, from, from non-devotees who have, I guess, no knowledge of this uh, concept of Krishna consciousness, they may tend to say something that is uh, uh, about, uh, say, about ISKCON or maybe about our gurus and you as a person, what you are practicing. And uh, especially when you are under a roof, when suppose if they come as a friend or as a relative, when they come and visit you, when they don't know what they're talking, they have never read Bhagavad Gita. And uh, it's easy to avoid such kind of people when you are like, you know, when they are not under one roof, when they're outside, but if they are just in the same, under one roof, then how to, like, avoid and how to tolerate and what is our dharma and how to deal with such sort of uh, people. So if you can uh, throw some light on that, Maharaj, I'll be really grateful. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the long question, but yeah, I think yeah. it was all about the place. So essentially, when people are negative or critical or when people are kind of, insensitive in the way they speak about Krishna consciousness or about anything of this nature, how do we respond to them without being, yeah, is that the question? Yeah. Yes, the first thing is we have to realize uh, everyone is on a journey. Once I went past a church and it said every saint had a past and every sinner has a future. And so we have to realize also that we, um, we were also there maybe, either in this life. Many devotees, you can see, they were very inimical even in this life. Um, and then they became devotees. And if not in this life, probably in previous lives, we were inimical. So the first thing is we have to realize everyone's on their journey. And uh, all I have to do in this situation is try to help this person come one step forward. Um, and so in every situation, just try to be a servant. Just try to ask yourself, what can I do in this situation to make this person a little bit more favorable? The problem is we take everything personally. But we have to realize, why are you taking it so personally? It's not your issue. It's their issue. Why are you making it your issue? Like if someone comes to you and says like, you know, uh, Gora Chandra, they, they probably call you not by your initiated name. Uh, why are you doing this useless Hare Krishna stuff? You know, why don't you uh, instead, you know, do something useful with your life? We take it so personally. Like we think it's an attack against us. But actually... Don't take it that it's your problem. It's their problem. They have a they have a misconception. They have a they have some kind of issue in their heart and mind, and therefore just help them. That's it. Don't take it personally. Um, and the other thing is that um, just change people not always by your words, but just by your character. You know. The great devotee Jayananda Prabhu, disciple of Srila Prabhupada, he was very, very famous for this, that he was such a nice person. He was such a, had such good qualities that anyone who came in contact with him, even if they were very inimical, uh, they were just charmed by his character. They were charmed by his saintliness. Sometimes to counteract someone's negativity, we try to counter it with more negativity. But that doesn't work. When you try to, when you get someone's negativity, absorb it with your saintliness and rise the dialogue to a higher level. You know what I mean? Don't let someone else's maya become your maya because then what happens is that you just drag people down. 
you you just go you go down with them you know so jayananda prabhu he would just be very very kind very very loving very very transcendental and after some time people were like wow you're just clearly on a higher level than me like what are you all about what what do what, what do you do what do you practice one very inimical lady when jayananda passed away she came to the devotees and you know what she said she said i don't know who you guys are i don't know what you guys believe in i don't know what you guys do all day but if jayananda is with you you must be good now that's amazing imagine that she didn't know anything about the philosophy nothing but just because of his character she was like i'm convinced you guys are amazing people so we have to convince we have to touch people's hearts you see we have to really touch people's hearts devotees their first and most important service description touch people's hearts that's your first service that's your first service every single day to touch as many hearts as you can and if you do that you know naturally that will absorb people's negativity so i know it's easier said than done because sometimes people they just say things and you just want to kind of you know you want to give them a piece of your mind um but resist that temptation and and learn that in this situation krishna is teaching me tolerance krishna is teaching me humility and krishna is trying to teach me to rise above some thoughts i hope it helps yes thank you very much maharaj very thank you so much maharaj thank, thank you so much um thank you. there are so many hands which have gone up so i'm my sincere request to everyone is to keep your question very brief as well as i would also request that please ask the questions only related to the topic today that we have i know uh, it is very rare to actually see maharaj and meet him uh, but let us uh, just talk on this current topic uh, aparna mata ji please go ahead hari krishna hari krishna prabhu ji speaks like a dream having to listen to you live so that's really wonderful my question is around gratitude prabhuji so what happens is when someone does any someone causes pain to you like damages you or make you go through a loss or anything you can still feel gratitude that okay krishna made it happen and he's sending us some lesson to learn but what happens is like i'm talking like as a person like individual i get withdrawn from the person though i do i can't forget the incident like the loss which was caused by that person to me but i just do not feel any connection that i get just withdrawn from the person saying that oh that person isn't a very good person to deal with so is it is it a right way to get that feeling probably i should be just swap it to a different side and treat them as equal forget the event forget the loss but also forget forgive the person so how do we get that combination if if that makes sense yes yes well forgiveness is a whole another topic and it's a big topic in the world we're living in today and yeah. forgiveness is also you know when rupa goswami explains the symptoms of bhav or spiritual emotion then he says the first characteristic of someone who's experiencing spiritual emotion kshantir they will be able to forgive others because you see when someone has such a broad vision of life then the small interactions of this world and the small uh you know uh different uh, things that we go through which uh which hurt us you don't start seeing them as significant anymore because you're aiming for something much much bigger uh why would you be so concerned with all the small affairs of this material world it's just like a computer game isn't it like a child is on a computer game and they're playing like you know fifa or football or something and they're like oh no i lost i lost and the adult is just looking at them thinking this is a computer game like before the child they're in that world 
So we're like children. We're in this world. It's like a virtual reality. We're playing these games. People are doing things, and we're taking it all so serious. When actually, there's a whole reality out there. We belong in the spiritual world, where every step is a dance, every word's a song. We're here, just a flash in eternity, and then we're gone. Why do we have to take it so seriously? Now, easy to say on a Zoom call. Difficult yeah. when it happens in life. <laughs> so, yeah, what it is is that in the beginning, in the beginning, Mataji, if you feel there is someone who has hurt you or someone who is causing pain, then keep some distance, you know, so that at least we don't get into arguments, we don't get into any negative, um, you know, interaction. Keep some distance. We need some breathing space, you know. Yeah. But then eventually what will happen is when we become more mature, we will realize, number one, I had to go through this. And that person was just a messenger. And number two, we'll realize that these things aren't so important. There's a, a bigger thing that I'm aiming for. And when these realizations naturally come in your heart, then you will be able to forgive. So in the beginning, if you need to keep some distance, keep some distance. But eventually what we have to try to do is let go of that negativity, that bitterness. Mandela, when he came out of prison, you know, he was wrongly imprisoned. So a devotee tried to give him the Gita and he said, I already read it. He said, really? He said, yeah, Hindu, one of my Hindu friends in prison gave it to me. The devotee said, what did you learn from it? He said, I learned from the Bhagavad Gita that the day I came out of prison, if I didn't also give up my bitterness, my frustration, my negativity towards the people who had perpetrated this injustice towards me, <clears throat> if I didn't give up all of those things, then I'd still be in prison even after leaving prison. The goal of life is not to remember all the terrible things that someone has done to you. The goal of life is to remember all the beautiful things that Krishna is doing to you every single day. But how will we be able to remember that if our mind is hijacked by all this negativity? So you have to let it go at some point. But until we are there, then we keep some distance. And then we just try to deepen our Krishna consciousness, deepen our knowledge, deepen our connection with Krishna. And when everything naturally becomes deeper, then all of these things dissolve. Uh, it doesn't become important anymore. Sure. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, we have lots of hands up. Uh, are you okay to take a few more questions? Uh, yeah, I'm okay if it's okay for yeah, you. That's fine. Good. Bharat Rajeshi Prabhu, uh, please go ahead. Dhanavad Pranam, Maharaj. Uh, very nice to hear from you live. You know, we are getting so much inspiration from your short videos uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> Maharaj, my question is, um, you know, on your table, the last point at the bottom, bottom right, uh, about, you know, showing it in actions. You know, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, some people um, are, you know, are not good at expressing, but they just do the activities, uh, you know, but how to see the gratitude, like, like their gratitude in, though, in their actions, like how can we perceive gratitude in others? You're I saying some people may not say in their words or they may not say, express their gratitude, but they're, they're doing it in their actions. So how do we appreciate that they are also grateful? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that's why, that's why also I, I'm sharing this with you today, like how, how we express our gratitude. You see, one time Shruti Kirti Prabhu, he, well, he was traveling with Srila Prabhupada as his servant. And every time they would reach an airport, you know what it's like, you know, the devotees would be a tumultuous kirtan, they'd be dancing, some of them crying, some of them falling flat in Dandavat, so many things. And one time after such a reception, Sri Tikirti Prabhu was massaging Srila Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, 
I don't have the love. I'm looking at all these devotees and when you come, they have so much love for you. They cry, they dance, they do all these things. I don't have any love. And then Prabhupada, you know what he said? He said to Sri Takirti Prabhu, uh, but do you like to serve me? And Sri Takirti Prabhu said, oh Prabhupada, I love to serve you. I wouldn't give that up for anything in the world. Prabhupada said, then you, that is love. So we also have to have a deeper vision. When we see the Vaishnavas, we have to not just see their words, not just see, but see the substance of their life. You see, everyone is a different type of person and everyone expresses their path in different ways. One time a devotee, he looked at Srila Prabhupada's passport picture. I don't know if you've seen Srila Prabhupada's passport picture. And so he said, Srila Prabhupada, you look very morose in that picture. <laughs> and then Prabhupada said, that was the most ecstatic moment in my life. He said, because when they took the picture on my passport, I knew now I'm going to fulfill the order of my spiritual master and travel around the world. He said, that was the most ecstatic. So Vaishnav means Gambhir. Gambhir means you can't understand like what's going on. So we should see that the substance of one's life is what they do, even more than what they say. You see, some devotees are very serious, isn't it? Like they don't they don't talk so much. They're very like I remember I came to the Hare Krishna movement. I'm a kind of more of a jovial person. So I smile at everyone. I try, you know, that's just my personality. Even when I'm miserable, I smile at people. Uh, somehow or other, that's just who I am. And some people are the opposite. They just, you never see them smile. And then all the mind in your mind, you can be thinking like, why is this person so miserable? Why is this person so angry? Why is this person so uptight? But it's just like some people are like that. It's like it's not personal. It's just some people are like that. So we need to see people more than the externals. You know, we need to see what is the substance of their life. They ask Gandhi, what is your message? And you know what Gandhi said? My life is my message. That was a good, that was a good line. That was like, my life is my message. Right? So let your life be your message. And when we look at others, let their life be their message along with their words like that. Sure. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, just one, I don't know if I can ask, I'll probably pass it on. If there is time, I'll ask one more question, Maharaj. Yes. Thank you, Bharat Rajeshi Prabhuji. And thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Sanyas Prabhu, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavar Pranam for such a nice class. Maharaj, uh, this question comes to me. This is, the feeling of gratitude is great, but how to deal with the fear of taking as granted? Yes, the more you have gratitude, yeah. the more you have gratitude, the less you will take things for granted. Because gratitude is not just a one-off emotion. Gratitude is increasing, actually, at every moment. You see, Krishna in the nectar of devotion is, uh, is being narrated about Krishna that when Krishna remembers how Draupadi put her hands up and called out Govinda, then it's said in the nectar of devotion that every time Krishna hears or thinks about that, his gratitude and appreciation for Draupadi is increasing. So it's not like, oh yeah, um, you know, that amazing thing happened for me. I've been grateful for that. Tick it off the list now. I've, I've done my gratitude. No, it's always increasing, you know. So gratitude is a dynamic quality. And when, when we don't experience that dynamism of gratitude, then what happens is we take things for granted. <coughs> and so... <laughs> gratitude also means like you know like there's this famous story of this teacher and she was asking all the children 
what are the seven wonders of the world? And then one child thought about Leaning Tower of Pisa, Eiffel Tower, Niagara Falls, you know, uh, Great Wall of China. And then one girl, she put her hand up and, and she said, the seven wonders of the world are that I can see, I can hear, I can touch, I can smell, I can see, I can laugh, and I can love. Finished. So there's a sense in which that's a very profound statement because it's like, can we be um, grateful for the things that um, are just present in our life every single day? Um, a truly grateful devotee is because they're realizing that um, everything is a blessing. Gandhi, he said that... <laughs> I complained that I didn't have shoes until I met someone who didn't have any legs. So I wanted to also, and thank you, you've also shared something. I'll add to that table that sometimes we are grateful for the big things, but um, can we also be grateful for the small things? Um, that is also a deeper level of gratitude. Um, so thank you. Your question has given me another uh, role to my table, which I will add in for the next presentation. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Sukhakrida Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Mataji, yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, it's a dream come true just to be able to ask you a question here. Um, so the question I have is, you mentioned about you know how um, the the highest level of gratitude is when we actually reciprocate. Now, um, when we think about Srila Prabhupada, you know what he has done for us, it's it's just beyond anything. And the only way, or rather, um, me as a person in being in Vihasta Ashram. I really like to reciprocate to the best possible extent. Now, the thing is, like, I have got two kids. I've got, you know, I mean, my husband is there and all that. And family responsibilities are there. But given, um, you know, if somebody asks me, you know, you want to do, I would love to do more and more services because um, this is our way of reciprocating in whatever way we can. Uh, at the same time, there are family responsibilities as well. So how how do we take that because I feel sometimes guilty that, you know, I'm not able to do more. Uh, but at the same time, the family needs me as well. So, it, and then, you know, so how do we balance that out? Yes. Yes, we hear about Srila Prabhupada and we just want to give everything. We want to give our time. We want to give our energy. And then sometimes we feel life has so many responsibilities. How do I free myself up? Let me give you a range of answers and, and hopefully some of them will resonate with you. First thing is, um, your family life is your service. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was one child of Bhakti Vinod Thakur and just see how much he did. Don't underestimate that the children you're bringing up in Krishna consciousness, they're amazing. Srila Prabhupada said they are demigods they're growing up in the movement that means they're basically there they're going to do amazing things and you can be a part of that so don't underestimate your service as a mother that's very very powerful um here i am today here yes i must pay respects to my mother because without my mother where would i be nowhere so don't just see that it's your service, but it's that the opportunity that you're giving for those who you're serving now and the service that they'll do. Dhruva Maharaj went back home, back to Godhead before he was going. He said, and my mother? Is my mother coming? Yes, yes, don't worry. She is on a plane. By the strength of your devotional service, your mother will also go. So... Please don't underestimate. Being a mother is an incredible service. <clears throat> the other thing is, in your family life, try to look at integration. <clears throat> try not to look at devotional service 
as just something that you do outside of your work, outside of your family time. But how can you do it inside your family or inside your career? For example, you go to work every day. That means that you're meeting people. Can you take some prashadam, some cookies for them? Can you make it a part of your life every day? That one person you meet, you should tell them about Krishna. Can you take some maha water and spike it in someone's drink so they get the mercy? Uh, what can you do to be a person who gives mercy out? You see, the Sankirtan devotees, they're always looking for an opportunity to give mercy. When we, whenever we were on book distribution, it was like we'd stop at the petrol station and it would take like 20 minutes to get out of the petrol station because on the way from the petrol pump to giving the Lakshmi for the petrol, the devotee would preach to about five people on the way and, and also the person on the counter as well. And it would be a whole thing because it's not like, oh, now we're not distributing books on the street. We know at all times they're in the role of sharing. So try to at all times be in the role of uh, a devotee. You'll be amazed how many people you can connect with. Some years ago on the, the first person in the world Sankirtan newsletter was one Mataji. She was a mother with like three children or something. And she was the biggest book distributor in the whole world. Um, where there's a will, there's a way. <clears throat> in London, they say where there's a will, there's a relative. <laughs> but the original one is where there's a will, there's a way. Um, but Mataji, there's so much more I could say on this. I wanted to share one more thing with you on this. Uh, and I like to share this because unqualified as I am, I can say that I have realization of it. By Krishna's mercy, I have realization of this. When you don't waste time, time expands. Right? When you don't waste time in your life, one of two things will happen. Number one, Krishna will empower you to do everything you're doing in your life in a quicker way. And what will happen is pockets of time start opening up. Or what will happen is that Krishna will send you some help in your life that takes certain things away, which means new spaces created in your life. I have this experience again and again and again, that when you don't waste time, time expands. And, um, you know, uh, If we can be in that, in that situation where we just consciously use every moment that we have, then why will Krishna not open up more opportunities for you to serve? He will. But we just have to have the desire. So um, Bhakti Tirta Swami, he said something amazing. He said, when your desire to serve is so great, that you go beyond your capacity, but you continue on without hesitation, at that moment, empowerment occurs. Yeah, I'll just say that again. When your desire to serve is so great that you go beyond your capacity, but you continue on without hesitation, at that moment, empowerment occurs. So, Krishna wants, Krishna wants you to have all the opportunities in the world. And we just have to show Krishna that we're serious, that we have the desire. And where that comes, um, Krishna will give you so many ways to show your gratitude and appreciation. And remember, it's a long life. So now you are a mother. Now you are in a household situation. Um, your kids will grow up at a certain point. And Krishna will open up more opportunities for you. So it's a long life. Srila Prabhupada got the order to spread the Krishna consciousness movement in 1922. But he didn't leave till 43 years later. 
the order of the spiritual master may be delayed, but it can never be denied. And so Srila Prabhupada spent a whole lifetime in preparation. So remember, whatever you're doing now is in preparation. You have a long life ahead, a bright life ahead, and you have so much you're going to do. So many opportunities will come about. So uh, play the long game. Do as much as you can now and realize that it's just the beginning. The, the future holds so much more. Some thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, are you still okay with time? We still have three more hands up here. Uh, can, will you be able to? Yes. Be okay. I can. I'm happy to carry on. What usually happens in these uh, calls is it becomes like a, you know, like when you have a flower, and all the petals start to come off, and then eventually you're only left with the bud. You know, so I think maybe it might be like this at the end of there might be only me left on this call and everyone. <laughs> Like, no, we will still be here. <laughs> Maybe we go another five, ten minutes, and then because sure. otherwise. Thank you, Maharaj, you know, for for being very kind and answering all the questions in uh, your detailed way. So, Parishanu Bhava Prabhu, please go ahead. If possible, please switch on your video as well, Prabhu. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare hey, Krishna, Dhanvat Pranam, Maharaj. Thank you for the Hare wonderful Hare. class. Like any any other. We are also listening to the short video and getting inspired. Um, you have a beautiful Maharaj. name, Parishanu Bhava. It's a beautiful name. Never heard that. I've never, um, this is first time heard when Maharaj, uh, my Gurudev gave me the name and I can't believe he spoke the whole Bhagavatam, that particular verse and the translation and the purport during the initiation ceremony. <laughs> yes, it's a beautiful Thank you, Prabhuji. Magic. Thank you, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, I've got uh, one question for the Prabhuji and one question for yourself. So one question is, we have a Bhakti Viksha program that we run here, Srila Prabhupada's Bhakti Viksha program. So I would like to get the end of this recording so we can pass it on to those devotees who missed out so that we can serve them. Uh, the question that I've got is, um, when we serve devotees and when we serve members as part of the Bhakti Viksha, at some point they will start glorifying you because they see the change in their lifestyle. They change, they see the change in their mood. They see the change in their calmness, all of this positivity things that are coming in their life. And they start glorifying you. We are not there to take the glorification at intellectual level. I've heard it so many times and I even do it that you pass it on to your Siksha Guru, then to your immediate Guru, then to the Prabhupada and to the lineage. So we pass it on. You don't take the glorification, we pass it on and try to remain humble. But that's at an intellectual level. What do we do at a physical level to have that gratitude and don't convert that into pride or an accident, false ego? So what do we do at a physical level, but intellectual level, we've heard it so many times to pass that glorification and don't take it. Thank you, Prabhu. It's such a nice, nice question. Yes, I feel this in my life also. <clears throat> in this life, I grew up as Sandeep Shah. And then I joined the temple and they started calling me Bhakta Sandeep. And then I got initiated and they called me Sutapadas. And nowadays they call me a Swami. And every day when I go to bed and I think behind all of those names, who am I? Am I a Swami? Maybe it's a role I'm playing right now. Just a soul, just a soul trying to find Krishna, just a soul trying to love Krishna. I think the first thing, Prabhu, is that we have to always spend time with ourselves and uh, spend time going deep, introspecting, realizing who was I, where was I, um, who are all the Vaishnavas that made me who I am. Uh, we have to be that thoughtful devotee who's regularly contemplating on that. You know, like uh, what I often used to do is I used to go back, even once I joined the ashram, some days I would escape from the ashram. <laughs> and what I would do is I would go back to my childhood places 
the football field where I used to play football, my old school where I used to, you know, um, go to. And just in those moments, I would realize like, wow, like where has my journey taken me? You know, who was I? It's good to reflect on your past, you know, um, because we realize, yeah, just some years ago, I was just some guy out there, you know. Nowadays, they bow down to me. They tell me, you're oh, Swami. Who am I? Just some years ago, I was just out there. I was a no one. And still, actually, I'm a no one. But it's just a mercy. So I think the first thing, Prabhu, is we have to become very thoughtful, introspective. Um, we are made of the mercy of the devotees, as I mentioned, Sanatan Goswami says. The second thing I think, Prabhu, is we have to have devotees in our life who are just very real with us. You know, the first person that's very real with me is my own mom. It's, it's amazing. Every single relationship in my life changed. There's only my relationship with my spiritual master changed. My relationship with my temple authorities changed. My relationship with my friends changed. There's only one relationship in this life that never changed to this day. And that's the relationship with my mom. It doesn't matter if you're a Swami. When you're in front of your mom, you're just a kid. You know, and uh, it's very good, you know. And not just that, I think to be around devotees who can just tell you, give you feedback. The moment we develop a character and a, and a, and a sense of a, 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 a energy around us where no one feels like they can come and correct us or give us feedback, then know for sure your spiritual life is going in the wrong direction. We need to always take feedback. So even today I have devotees and they come and they're just very, not in a rude way, not in a, but we're very open. And they can tell me, you know, no, you're becoming proud or, you know, you, you said this or you did that. And I've, it's very good for me, you know, to have feedback. So I think always have people who can give you feedback in your life. And then I would say the third thing is prayer. Don't underestimate the power of prayer. Go in front, make it a point. Go in front of the deities every single day. Go in front of your altar every day and just always be prayerful. Um, one Srila Prabhupada, he was giving a class and he said, I'll never fall down. And then after he gave the class, he came off the Vyasasana and he was in front of the deities and he was praying. And then Mother Yamuna, after she asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, what were you praying for? And Prabhupada said, I was praying to Krishna that I may never fall down. And, and she said, but Prabhupada, so you said in the class, you will never fall down. And Prabhupada said, because, I, because I'm always praying, therefore I will never fall down. So you have to pray. You have to come in front of Krishna and say, Krishna, it's so easy for me to become overcome by my own illusion." Please, please keep me humble. Uh, so every day we must pray for this humility. It's very powerful. So, yeah, there's so much more that could be said on this, you know. But remember your past, have good friends, and uh, always be in a prayerful mood. And um, realize that beyond all the titles, beyond all the positions, beyond all of the names and the labels, uh, we are just beggars. We're just beggars in front of Krishna. Um, yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna. Devoti Kapil, Kapila Prabhu, please go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thanks for the nice class. Uh, so I was just contemplating on, uh, you know, some of the answers you gave and I just got like a thought and a question. So it is partially answered, but I'm still uh, asking. So apologies if <laughs> you have to repeat yourself. Um, so we do come across different Vaishnavas during our spiritual journey and some may be really, really advanced. And 
we may not realize that but as in when we advance and you know when we start understanding the philosophy more the different bhavs as you stated rightly in the nectar of devotion and that time you know krishna gives you like a lot of realizations like boom 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 everything comes together so we get like a sense of feeling that maybe at that time like technically there is no envy between that association in the past so there may or may not be enough and so my question is when we have strong realizations about previous association so do we have to worry that whether we have committed an offense and go and ask for forgiveness when we especially do an introspection as you rightly said krishna will give us more opportunity so that we don't feel guilty but i just wanted to understand do we actually incur any karma or offenses during that process so if he has sort of the ways to purify that so later on you realize oh a devotee is very advanced the devotee is actually very dear to krishna and then you lament how you interacted with them before yeah yeah like maybe that. we should have been grateful but the realization comes later <laughs> but we have not distressed but even our dreams says the same thing yeah. to krishna isn't it krishna shows the universal form and then arjun was like oh my god you you are i was sitting on a seat with you we were joking we were playing we were just friends you know and now i realize you're this universal form like so sometimes that realization comes with devotees in my life i realized that actually i underestimated devotees a lot you know at the manor we had one one of our brahmacharis his name was janaki nath prabhu i wrote a book about him called loving life embracing death because what happened is at 31 while he was in the ashram as a brahmachari he got diagnosed with cancer and then he lived for another 5 years and then he left the world so i wrote about his life and and you know all those years that i was living with him as a brahmachari he would have the locker next to me I was just like, yeah, this guy is a little spaced out. Can't even make it to Mangal Aarti, you know. Like, he's always scruffy, you know. Not a kind, a little bit unreliable, you know. And I always, and then later on, when he got his cancer, and 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 how he reacted in that situation, and the level of Krishna consciousness that he displayed, I was so humbled because I was like, oh my God, I just thought he was just like. my little brother you know just oh yeah is you know and i realize he's very very exalted uh we are living with saints one thing i share with all of you on the call in my life i realize one thing i used to think that the saints were people of the past and now having spent some years in this movement i realize that the saints are we are living among the saints there are saintly people believe it or not in this movement believe it or not there are saintly people in your yatra believe it or not there may even be some saintly people in your temple they are there they are existing Uh, but often we underestimate so what do we do <clears throat> we show our love and our appreciation by serving others so when that realization arises that maybe i wasn't grateful then we take the opportunity to be grateful now so serve those vaishnavas assist them help them um try to uh, express your gratitude for them in an appropriate way uh it's never too late to say thank you it's never too late to show your appreciation it's um even when i was with janaki nath in the final days my he was the brahmachari who left one day was mother's day and he said like he 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 called me and he said did you send your mother a card it's mother's day i said like come on man like we don't do all these things he like we are like we in the ashram like we are brahmacharis you know he said you send her something and then what he did is he called the flower florist and he arranged for all these flowers to be sent you know 
Anyway, something happened in between, but I won't go into that. But he was saying, no, you should send her flowers. You should. And I said, no, no, I didn't do it in all these years. And he said, it's never too late to say thank you. So there, always there's an opportunity. So we should do it now. Otherwise, what will happen? The opportunity may go. And then we may think, oh, that Vaishnava was there. And I didn't even say. We should be more gracious. You know. When it comes to saying something nice about someone, we often contemplate like 20 times. Should I say it? Should I not say it? Maybe I should. I don't know. Should I say it? Finally, we squeeze out some appreciation. No, no. Be, be, a, be a magnanimous Vaishnav. Always share your love. It's a movement of love. It's a community of love. Yes, Pooh, some thoughts. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, Akshata Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble blessing to uh, Maharaj, I wanted to ask, to like you answer the previous question. So you should be magnanimous and appreciating. So, of course, there are many uh, like friends also in the Yeti circle who are uh, contributing, who are helping in devotional service. But sometimes at the same time, if we find that someone is uh, sometimes insecure or hiding something or sometimes little envious or something, so how we should ignore such things and still be grateful for whatever they have contributed in our life? Sometimes people, uh, they, ex they do some service, but there may be some insecurities and envy, some different things, like how do we deal with people who are um, like that? Um, one thing that's really, really important, one art that we need to learn is the art that I call learning to hear the unheard. You see, oftentimes what happens is when we react to people, we don't try to understand what is the deeper thing that is going on uh, behind the acts that they're performing. You understand? Like, let me, let me share with you. Like, say, for example, if someone constantly wants sympathy and the hidden story is that in their life, they were never really understood by people. That's, that's what's causing them to constantly look for sympathy. For example, if someone is always looking for attention, the hidden story is that in their life, not many people appreciated them. If someone is constantly trying to control and dominate a situation, then the hidden story is that in their life, they were probably not protected or they were probably exploited. And if someone is constantly looking for independence, for example, is the hidden story is that in their life, they were probably not given empowerment or opportunities. So the Vaishnava is very expert because what it is, is that instead of reacting to people's immediate words and acts, what they try to see is what is the hidden story here? They don't get frustrated by people's acts, but they try to see what is behind this. What is, uh, what, what, what's the, why are, what is causing them to act like this? Sometimes I tell the story of the teacher who was trying to teach the child maths. So the teacher said, here's one orange, here's another orange. How many oranges? The child said three. He said, no, let's try again. One orange, another orange. Three. He said, oh, my God. He said, here's one apple. Here's another apple. How many apples? He said, two. He said, okay, great. Here's one orange. Here's another orange. How many? He said, three. The teacher was getting so frustrated. And then the child said, but I have one orange in my packed lunch. <laughs> right? So we get frustrated because we're just looking at the immediate but we don't understand there's a hidden story. And when you understand that hidden story, 
then you can understand, oh, that's why they're like this. But we don't take the time to understand the hidden story. So it's difficult because how many hidden stories can we uncover about all the different people to understand their psychologies? But at least as Vaishnavas, we should be aware that every soul is beautiful. Every soul is amazing. And even when they act sometimes with envy, with insecurity, with on a power trip, um, behind it is something causing them to be like that. And let's try and understand that and address that rather than just reacting to their um, activities like that. Thank you, Mark. Okay, it's a two hour mark. <laughs> Shall we stop there? Because we could continue going on. And, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, man. Luckily, I think the, flower, the flower hasn't completely disappeared yet. All of you flower like devotees are already here. So before you disappear, I think I should, you know, maybe bring it to an end. Thank you very much, Maharaj. I think you have spent a lot of time with us and we are very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Let us show our appreciation by loudly chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.